Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living and today I'd like to do something I actually haven't done in quite a while and that is do a repairman's overview of a saxophone model. Um, I've kind of done most of the ones I normally see, you know, so my rules for doing a repairman's overview are, uh, you know, it has to be a horn that I've overhauled, um, it has to be a horn I'm familiar with, um, it can't be a Mark VI because everyone already has opinions on that, um, and it has to be a horn that people are, are either buying regularly or that I think is actually really worth attention if it's not getting bought. Um, this fits all of those categories except for the first one. I'm not super familiar, but it's hard to get familiar with these horns because you just don't see them in the U.S. too much. Now what I'm talking about, and pardon my pronunciation, this is a French company, um, is a Coeno, C-O-U-S right? No. Sorry. C-O-U-E-S-N-O-N. -E um, and if we go to Google, we can ask her to say it. In French, she would say, Quino. And it's funny if you ask her to say it in English, she says, Cousinon. <laughs> and the model of this is the Monopole, which in French sounds like Monopole. And translated to English is Monopoly. Um, and so this is a Quinon. And apparently the S in there, depending on your French accent, you could say it or not. So, Cuenon or Cuesnon. Um, this was a French company that is still around in name, at least. They still have a factory where they make what they call hunting horns, just like a, it looks like a French horn with no keys. Um, but the company itself has been around since 1827, and it was purchased by the Cuenon family in 1883. They were typically associated with like marching and fanfare type of instruments, but then they started to make a line called Monopole, which was higher quality instruments. They were trying to gain more customers um, as the sort of marching and fanfare music fell out of favor and they needed to continue making instruments. In the late 1800s, they actually had over a thousand employees and that went steadily downward um, after that. But one of the things they tried to do to stick around and stay relevant was to make uh, conservatory quality instruments and indeed the highest level of instrument you could get was the monopole conservatoire um, the monopole typically came for saxophones in like three or four different levels um, either one two three and four or a b and c and it went from the simplest key work to the you know most ornate uh, elaborate and the first level, A or 1, you actually don't see those too much. They didn't even have an automatic octave key. It was like the old instruments from the 1800s where you actually had two different octave keys rather than one octave key that switches automatically. Um, so typically what you see is going to be the you know B uh, or the 2 or the 3. Or if it says conservatoire on it and it has like all the different trill keys, then sometimes that's the level 4 or C. This one does have a high F sharp. Um, it also has something I really, really like uh, on instruments, a switchable automatic G-sharp. So if you don't need it, C-sharp actuates by itself. But if you need it, then C-sharp actuates the G-sharp as well. And we're having a little bit of trouble because of the gravity. but And it actually works really, really well. And they have a patent for this particular key uh, in 1935. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't put this on horns before then. A lot of times you'd you know, see stuff that was patent uh, pending. Um, but that helps us date this horn, which is good because Quinon is not very good with serial numbers. First of all, they didn't seem to have any serial numbers before 1937. And then after that, it seems like they gave one segment of serial numbers to altos, like one to tenors, one to sopranos, one to baritones. And it doesn't seem like they're actually like, you know, in chronological order either. And they restarted serials um, several times. So this one is serial number 2177. It is a uh, Koinon Monopole 1. There's two series. This is the left-hand bell keys. There was split bell keys, left-hand bell keys, and right-hand bell keys. This, this is a left-hand bell keys, a Monopole 1. Um, and it is a fantastic instrument, at least in alto, the one I've got here. It just plays so well. Let's see if we can hear a little bit of that pad pop. Um, the tone hole, so the, the construction of this instrument is pretty darn good. Now, it seems like to me there's sort of 
in the 30s and before. Some, in the 30s, it kind of changed over for most saxophones where they went from being a bit more of an artistic endeavor to more of an engineering endeavor. And this seems to be kind of straddling that line. It's built very, very well, but I can tell there's a bit of variability. Um, and I've seen instruments a few serials before it that have rolled tone holes. I've seen instruments that have rolled and brazed mixed. This one has all brazed tone holes with the exception of the high F sharp, which is rolled, which is the weirdest one you could possibly roll because of where it is in the body, but that's what they did. Um, it also has a low C tone hole that is shaped like an oval. Um, this is the old pad that came out. Um, I was expecting a major challenge to get that seated well, but I figured I could do it if they did it, but actually it ended up going in really, really easily. And part of that is because these tone holes are probably the most level I've ever seen from a factory. Now I know that it's factory because um, this horn would had most of its original pads when it came to me. Um, and it also had really kind of cool, some uh, Quignon reeds. Let's see if I can get it up with my gloves on. Those would be La Vaz. But yeah, here's a Quignon reed. Looks like it never got played, huh? Um, I'll put these back in there. This goes to the owner. So I actually bought this horn for myself and I put it up on my website because I needed a horn to be in my for sale section so that it showed up as a section on my website. Um, surprise, somewhat surprisingly to me because I didn't really fill out the um, description. Uh, an old customer of mine asked, he started asking questions about it. So I pulled it out, I played it on its original pads. It was hard to play down, you know, down low, but man, the sound was just incredible. So I became really intrigued. He decided he wanted to go ahead and buy it. So I got to overhaul this and it is just a fantastic player. The intonation is really great. The tone is really beautiful, very, very French, kind of like centered, mid-rangey, um, and the build quality is excellent. Now, I've actually already got another Quino, a Monopole 2, on the way. Um, this one I think I'm going to keep, or that one I think I'm going to keep for myself after, uh, you know, overhauling. I got to obviously give this one away. Um, not give it away. I sold it. <laughs> Let's be clear. Um, I made that decision but I do regret it just a little bit. It's such a fantastic instrument. Now, as far as overhauling it, like I said, it's kind of on the art side of things versus the engineering side of things. So you might find some strange things where you sort of have to like, you know, like some, some of these posts weren't perfectly aligned. Um, the, like there's some odd decisions, like, let's see, where is it? I'm not sure if you can see it, but this post right here underneath the F sharp, that's the octave, part of the octave mechanism is on there. And that rod actually goes through that post right down here. Um, so there's kind of some unusual decisions like that in the manufacturing, um, but nothing you can't get around. I would put it on par with like a New Wonder Series 1, New Wonder Series 2 as far as build quality. Now, if you've seen my New Wonder Series 1, you know I was pretty sour on it at the time. The reason was people were trying to sell those at the time as being basically the same as a New Wonder Series 2, which was basically the same as a 10M. Hard to imagine, but this is 15 years ago. Um, and those horns are different in the way they play and the way they're built and the quality of the construction. Now, if I were to make that video over again, I wouldn't be quite so sour on it. Um, but I leave it up because I don't really feel like making another video and, um, yeah, people don't complain too much. Uh, but I would say the construction on this is probably expected for these. This one, I think it was made in the forties. I'm not totally sure, but these early monopoles, I would expect the construction to be somewhat variable if very, very good. Um, so you might have like some strange things you have to attend to here and there, but overall it was a pretty easy overhaul, much easier than I expected given what the horn looks like and when it's from. Um, you may also notice it doesn't have the typical, uh, bell wire. It just has a folded bell. Um, like I said, the key, the tone holes on this one were brazed, but they can be rolled as well. I don't know if that was like a thing that happened all at once or what, because the serial numbers are not something you can really go by. But I know the rolled tone holes ones are fine too. This one was braised and it plays fantastic. Um, it does have a high F sharp. It actually plays really well in tune. The mechanism is not bad at all. Um, the ergonomics feel pretty good. The left hand pinky table, as you can see, is the old style. Um, but it's you know pretty smooth, pretty well actuated, and with that little switch there, you can make it extremely light on the C sharp, which is typically the biggest problem with these um, old 
pinky mechanisms is you just don't have a whole lot of leverage right here. So when you end up pushing the C sharp and the G sharp down at the same time, if everything isn't perfect, this one actually feels great. But if everything isn't perfect, um, that can be a bit of a, a bit difficult for some people. So having that be able to switch on and off is pretty cool. Um, and SML also did this with a different mechanism, but they also had a switch. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, I, and I really like how easy this one is to use. I mean, you could, you could probably use it on the fly if you wanted to, but I don't see why you would want to. Um, like I said, overall build quality is pretty darn good. Fitting the neck was a little bit difficult. Now you've got this, this looks, you know, again, here, here's the art versus engineering. You can tell that this was, you know, modified by hand. That is not an even cut. But that, when you put this in, that actually goes around where the F-sharp tone hole is. So the F-sharp tone hole impinges on the tenon a bit. So your ceiling surface isn't quite as, you know, much as you would get if that wasn't there. So fitting the neck was a little bit of a challenge, but it went through okay. Um, the pivot screws are real pivot screws. They have, you know, they are tapered. They're easy to fit. The springs are pretty nice on this horn. Um, the metal itself is pretty nice. The bell's a little bit thin. You might be able to see here. It's a little flexy. Um, so you might see like on this one, you know, it's got a little bit of ripples here and there, even though this is a very, very well-kept instrument. Um, the plating seems like it's silver directly on brass which is why it's flaking in some places versus wearing. Now, you see that in European instruments around World War II more often than you see it anywhere else. This appears to be pretty well stuck on, but uh, there was a little bit of flaking that happened when I cleaned it, and that just means it was separating already because um, it doesn't silver doesn't stick to brass as well as it does to like copper, so a lot of times we'll do a really quick flash of copper and then silver. It doesn't look like that was done on this horn. Um, the... Uh, bell guards are a bit ornate and they have lots of screws keeping everything together but it ended up working really well in practice and it's nice and quiet. Um, the felts are just adhered to the here and then you there's no there's not even like really a socket like recess so I just put them on with shellac and then cut them and that can be a little bit of a pain to get that like exactly where you want it especially with the B and the B flat since they have to be aligned and that's sort of a difficult process to do with just cutting but it's nothing too unusual. Um, now these horns, you don't see them in the U.S. too much. Um, you see them in Europe a lot more, and Quinon make made a Quinon made a ton of horns, um, but the Monopole series is the one that you want, right? That is the one that was made to be a conservatory quality instrument. As a matter of fact, Marcel Mule, who later worked with Selmer, worked with um, Quinon from about nineteen, I think nineteen twenty eight to nineteen thirty eight. Um, when he went over to Selmer and had a much more famous association there. But uh, Marcel Mule, this is pr this is probably, like, this first series of Monopole is probably what you can consider, like, the fruits of that uh, association, where Marcel Mule was working with Quinon and changed, uh, sorry, Quinol, and changed a lot of what you see in their horns from the, you know, 20s to the 30s. They really grew up, and they really started making horns that I think are, you know, worth playing, this being one of them. Um, let's see, what else? Do I have anything else I wanted to say? I feel like I've been talking for a while already, but, um, oh, okay, so split bell keys seems like it's the 1930s, uh, into the 40s. Left-hand bell keys is late 40s to, like, 1949. I mean, it seems like the left-hand bell keys really didn't go along for a while. The right-hand bell keys, 1950s through the end, and the end being the late 70s. There was actually, I think I already mentioned this, there was a factory fire, in um 19 let's see 1969 there was a factory fire and that's why we don't have any records um, of the serial numbers but the Monop monopole one uh, was made from i think the 20s is when they started doing that maybe earlier i'm not totally certain um but the you know late 20s um is kind of where you might want to start looking at these i think probably 30s would be a better bet if it's got left-hand bell keys or right-hand bell keys, I think for me that would be what I'd be looking for. Um, the split bell keys seem like they are a quite bit earlier design. Um, now also, there's not a ton of information out there about these instruments. I'll put a bunch of links down below, and if you've got more to add in the comments, feel free. If you're watching this in the future, I made this in 2023, um, and there's a lot more information out there, fantastic. That's great. Um, basically what I wanted to say with this video is that this is a fantastic playing instrument, in alto at least. 
I really, really liked it. I was super surprised by it. If you find them, they're fairly cheap. It was not that hard to work on. It plays in tune. It's got a great tone. It's built well. I think that this is a, a another contender for a worthwhile vintage saxophone. Um, and in the U.S., they're just not that common. So I would like to put my vote forward for people to pay a little more attention to uh, Coenon, particularly the uh, Monopole series from the you know, 40s onwards. The Monopole 2 is uh, very easily recognized. It's got a really large key guard here. And actually, so Quinon's, Quinon's testers were Marcel Mule, and then, uh, then he went to Selmer. And Daniel Defaye was Mule's student, and then uh, he worked with Quinon, and then he went to Buffet. And then, uh, pardon my pr mispronunciations, Michel Noah, no, no. Um, worked with Quinon, and then he went to Yamaha, and that's when Yamaha had that big key guard like the Monopole 2. Um, also worked with Selmer. So anyhow, that is a long, rambling introduction to uh, the world of Quinon saxophones for me. From my perspective as a repairman, I would say, you know, get the ones, get the, get the later ones. You can do a left-hand bell keys, Monopole 1, and it's this is a fantastic instrument. I'm very interested to see what the Monopole 2 is like. Like I said, I've got one on the way for myself, and I also have somewhat of a rarity. Um, Quinon made a Monopole 2 that was a low A, and I'll be overhauling this relatively soon, um, and I'll let you guys know what I think. And this one is keyed to high G. Right? High G? Yeah, there, sorry, there's the high G on the other side. High F sharp, high G. Um, but, and you can see this one still has that little switch, huh? Cool, right? So there you have it. Hopefully you found that helpful, useful, and informative. I'm very excited to get more into these horns um, and hopefully find another worthwhile vintage saxophone that can be had for not a ton of money on the front end. Um, and that provides excellent results once overhauled. Now, I will go ahead and append the play test uh, after this. Um, be aware, though, that it was done on a phone. It's not ideal uh, situations, but it should give you an idea. You know, listen for intonation. Listen to, like, how much fun the player is having. Listen to the flexibility. And listen to that tone, like, how it's kind of, like, mid-rangey, right? Um, that is, to me, sort of a French characteristic, is that real strong mid-range, um, sort of, you know, rounded, uh, like, tone to it. Um, anyhow, hopefully you found that helpful, useful, informative. Thanks for watching. Oh, and apologies for how long and rambly this is. Um, I This is, like, the only moment I could do this. I'm in between things, and I literally have to pack this up and go to the post office, like, right now. Thanks for watching. Camera. This is Tyler Anderson. He's coming over here to play this... Quinon, Quinol, and uh, Quinon, one, Quinon. see if I'm crazy, and two, give a sound sample because he plays a lot better than me.
so uh, my initial impression just based on playing that is uh, it feels like there's a lot of flexibility in the horn. Um, and I was trying to push some of it, and some of the stuff is uh, just, like, from being on a, a horn that I've never played before and not really able to, like, totally lock in where it's comfortable, but it's there, and I was looking for it, and there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of ability to play with the song. I feel like I can get uh, really quiet. And I can also just open the thing up. So yeah, I feel like any like anything that's not really speaking well is just uh, not really where no knowing where stuff is on this particular horn. But um, and then the other thing about it is the key works really nice, so I feel like I can just like. kind of really sweet tone but uh, it also feels good to open up um and kind of burn on it i don't know it's a great horn cool man yeah so that's a 